known to everybody I should just say Rick Kennedy and sit down but I think there are some things you should know about him um, he's been around this show for a long time as a dealer he's given talks here before uh, on a number of subjects uh, that he's very well uh, familiar with uh, but uh, like many of us he got started collecting at a very early age uh, he started around seven or eight uh, I think that is a common story for us um, he got, a, uh, got interested in geology and got a bachelor's degree from the UC uh, University of California in Santa Clara and uh, immediately launched into uh, getting more active in serious collecting. And he has been very serious uh, and seriously evol involved in a number of collecting ventures uh, through the years. Uh, of course, you're familiar with the San Benito County, California, uh, the Benitoite, Neptunite. Uh, Rick has mastered the preparation techniques for the, uh, those minerals, and he's given talks about that before. Uh, he got involved, uh, uh, well, he started collecting at Hallelujah Junction uh, in the 1990s uh, and started collecting there. And then uh, it wasn't until um, about uh, 10 or 15 years ago that he got seriously involved uh, in, with partners collecting there, and that led to other ventures uh, like Jackson's Crossroads, Georgia, something near and dear to my heart. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Rick Kennedy, uh, who is going to tell us about uh, recent finds. Oh, I want, did want to say one other thing. Uh, the uh, March-April issue of uh, Mineralogical Record uh, this year uh, there was an article on Hallelujah Junction that goes through the history, has a lot of uh, photographs of, of great specimens from Hallelujah Junction. Go by uh, Rick's booth. He's got an incredible display of finds, mostly from this year. Uh, mostly, yeah. And um, there are some great exhibits featuring Hallelujah Junction specimens. So, okay, now. Okay. Thank you, Julian, for all the kind words. Uh, I also just want to echo what he said it is great to be back here. Isn't it great to be back here? It's been about 15 years for me out here, and it remains one of the funnest get-togethers because of all of you guys. There's just such a wonderful combination of the old, the young, we all love minerals, we all geek out to the weirdest, coolest things. And as I look here, I see a whole new generation of people that's taking the mantle from us, and you guys are awesome. You're running with it, you're out there in the field, and you're learning your mineralogy. It's just really exciting to be here. And so, again, thanks to all of you guys. And that's the talk. No. <laughs> so, most of you are familiar with Hallelujah Junction, a show of hands. What a good show of hands. Part of the reason why people are so familiar is almost all of us have had a chance to dig there. So, to move on here, where is Hallelujah? It is right up here a little bit north of Reno. And here's a little bit better look. And these are things that I have uh, gleefully stolen from the article. Um, it is in many ways as known for the steepness and cra craziness as the road to get up there as it is the minerals, but we're just going to look at the minerals and specifically the different forms that the quartz shows. And about half of this is going to look at the oddities, which I'm not necessarily sure technically can be considered forms, but they're just so interesting and cool. And the geology behind them is fascinating. We on the crew will stay up till two or three in the morning sometimes talking about how did that happen with any particular rock. So moving on, here's an aerial view. And again, 
This is the southernmost claim, which is owned by SIO2 Partners, and then over here are our claims, which are owned by Hallelujah Partners. Interestingly enough, the two areas are relatively different, but for the purpose of this talk, I will concentrate on the things that we've dug from our mine, because that's the ones that we have most experience with. So, as most of you know that we're up there, we look for pockets, and we have a machine, an excavator, that will come and scrape the walls, and then we dig pockets by hand. Uh, the picture on the right is a pretty good sized one. That's probably about you know, two by four feet. That's a pretty good sized pocket for us. So, Hallelujah Junction is world famous for the scepters. But one of the things you're gonna see is there's just a lot of different stuff going on. But this was a nice collection of scepters. So, first step, first generation smoky quartz. Basically, points. Um, we have some naturally occurring radiation in the area which has caused them to come, become smoky over the last 90 to 100 million years. Uh, as you see on the picture on the right, that's the same uh, crystal. A lot of these are very, very high quality and very gemmy internally, which is really nice. So, also from the single generation, you get these clusters. And this, uh, we actually named this one the chandelier. Uh, Jack George found this pocket, and I was hap lucky enough to dig this particular piece. And like in many silly pictures, I completely forgot I had a Bluetooth in my ear. Um, such is life and God the hair, but you know, that's just me. So the other thing in these clusters, you start looking at them more closely and maybe not all of them are first generation. In this one, you can see on the picture on the right shows it really well, though it looks like one good homogeneous cluster. On the right, you can see the base of the crystal in the middle. Let's see, is it a different angle? than these other ones. One of the great stories of Hallelujah Junction is multiple periods of crystal growth and recrystallization. And especially when you get into everything after the first generation, it's these multiple generations that create these really exquisite forms. So, candles and doubly terminated crystals. This is a nice DT, if you note, that was the edge that was probably broken off and then recrystallized in order to form that. And a lot of times, these second generation terminations will have uh, less smoky coloration than the rest of the crystal. So here's a couple of more normal candles. And we, we call them candles because you've got these heads that are colorless to white. They can be cloudy or like that one's a little gemmy. And somebody a long time ago said they look like a candle. So what everybody gets excited about are scepters. And uh, this was a particularly fun one uh, that was actually dug by somebody here. John, you recognize that rock? Good. And Ian was helping John in the pocket and held it. And whenever something really big happens, you end up with a whole pile of people that want to take a look. That's part of the joy of collecting. So this is probably the most perfect, straight, simple scepter that we've ever found. Uh, Joe George uh, found the pocket and extracted the piece. Uh, named it the Wizard's Wand. It is, and this is a photo by Joe as well. Uh, this was a very, very special moment on the mine for all of us. And this is the Shangri-La of what we are looking for in a scepter. So here's another couple of simple scepters. Again, as you look at them, you've got the head is lighter in color, 
These have these beautiful jemmy stems. These are both pieces in my collection. Um, these are very nice, high quality pieces. And the, the one on the right has a little bit more of a cloudy head than the one on the left does. What you'll see is there's all kinds of different heads you're gonna see. So we have citrine, we have cloudy with just a little hint of amethyst at the top. And then we have one that's uh, actually pictured in the, the article uh, is one that I found that's in Mark Salzgaber's collection that is a, a smoky with a, a much more amethystine tip. And the amethyst is the last period of crystallization that happens. And we find, we have figured four to five different periods of crystallization, but not all pocket gets all of them. So different pockets will have completely different looks, even if they're right next to each other. I think we see this in a lot of localities. So it's just, you never know what's going to be in each pocket. And the size of the pocket does not necessarily determine the quality. That's one of the things that, as a crew, we're always trying to tell our diggers. Small pockets sometimes have the best pieces. The piece on the right came from a pocket barely bigger than my fist. So it's very rare that we get a good picture of something before we've actually dug it out. And this is a matrix scepter. And as you see, almost all of the minerals, all of the crystallization happens from the roof down. So here is the scepter. And the rest of this is the cluster. And uh, again, in a very good showing of teamwork, uh, Paul Geffner found this pocket and then he enlisted all of us to extract it. And when you get a group of highly motivated people that actually show a little patience and skill, that's what comes out. So that's what it looked like after initial cleaning, um, as well as the nice view from our little Airbnb. But as you can see, most of this piece is single generation points, only one sceptered. I'd love to be able to tell you why. I don't know. Um, maybe it gets, you know, that one was longer than everything else, and so the second generation only went there. Maybe it was, it had a certain amount of mica on it. We go back and forth with trying to figure out a lot of the hows and whys of the mineralization here. So here's a few more matrix pieces. Uh, the first one is called Glory, Glory, Hallelujah and was uh, discovered by Jack George and Joe George. And Joe was the one who found all the fits and put it together. The second piece was a very unusual pocket. It was a double chambered pocket. The top chamber had three large cathedral quartzes, and then the second chamber had this lovely matrix scepter, and this was found by Dan Evanich. So the one on the left is a relatively small amethyst scepter, very different in that the whole piece is gemmy and it's you don't see very much you know the separation of the different uh periods of crystallization this was found in 1994 and i got it from a gentleman named joe jelks and then this is i think the only piece here that was found on the si02 partners claim and I dug that one with Jan Johnson in 2012 or 2011, if I remember correctly. And you can see it's got a, a little stem and the amethyst is again the last stage and you'll see it grow in the tops and the bottoms of these bulb-like structures. Complex scepters. These require generally more than two different periods of crystallization. So the one on the left is just a funky thing with two heads, 
and a little bit of other stuff going on. It's slightly tabular. It's a weird, weird rock. The one on the right is shown at two different angles. You've got the original head, but there's also two other heads sticking to it. It's very possible that is a result of recrystallization and stuff that broke off and fell and then fused in a pocket. It's also very possible that it just decided to grow here, then grow off of here, and then grow off of there. They're very interesting and odd. And uh, if anybody wants to come look at this one, we actually have it next door. This is the holy grail for us at, as scepter collectors at Hallelujah Junction is the dumbbell or barbell where you get a scepter, it breaks off, and then it forms another scepter at the bottom. We've only really found three great ones of these since 2014 when um, uh, Paul and his partners bought the mine from Foster. This is one that was found this year by Joe, and it is really lovely. And the other thing that's special about it, this is the original scepter and termination, and then this is the, the one that came later. It's very unusual for the second one to be as clear as this is. And it's also got a little nice bit of a citrine look to it. Uh, again, it makes it one of the, easily one of the two best we've ever found. So the last period of crystallization is kind of, I don't know what I'd call it necessarily, but basically these form a lot of people will call them celestials, they'll call them cathedrals, they'll call them jacare style courts. You can call it anything you want, really. They are basically, these tried to fill the pocket. There is a lot of growth, there's a lot of smoky, there's where you'll find both amethyst and potentially ametrine. And they get funky, weird, and they can get really big. Uh, especially at the claim next door, I dug one that was about that big. And it wasn't the prettiest thing in the world because, again, it, it finds every little nook and cranny in the pocket to grow into. But often these are caps in a pocket where once you remove that, uh, actually one of the best barbell we ever found, Barbella, was the result of pulling out a... a, a bulb about that big and underneath it was the rest of the pocket and the um, barbella was sticking straight up. And if we hadn't been so careful removing the large bulb, we might have damaged the tip of barbella, which would have been really awful and tragic. So again, here's a, a couple more looks at this style of the last bit of crystallization that happens. The one on the left is actually about as equant as you tend to get in these. And then the one on the right has had its own little extra fun bit of recrystallization. It's a little hard to tell here, but the bottom portion here is all recrystallized. And there's another little crystal that kind of fused to it. It looks like a whale's tail. The last of the normal forms are twins. Twins are very rare at Hallelujah Junction. And um, I think both of these are actually in Neil Prenn's collection. I think Neil's back there somewhere. Uh, there have been more Japan Law twins found than anything else out there. But there's also been uh, a, a few RG twins. And somebody that knows more than I can can help. Is a 3032 twin in RG? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, so at least three different types of twins we found up there. Again, they are very, very rare. And they're one of the, they're like the only form of oddity that I've never found in all my years digging up there. So kudos to all that have found them. Now the weird stuff. <clears throat> and this is probably some of my favorite stuff out there because the oddities happen as a result of multiple periods of breakage, recrystallization. In case, I'm pretty sure everybody here knows this. 
Rock and crystal forming is not easy on stuff. You are dealing with high temperatures, high pressures, tectonic activity, and these pockets get beat to heck by nature. They get weathered, but more than anything else, they get broken a lot. But because there were multiple periods of recrystallization, they also get fused and healed quite a bit. This is a perfect example. I nicknamed this one Cerebus. I found this in like 2010 or 2011 before I was more involved with things and ended up purchasing it from Foster Holman about five, six years later. It has a citrine head, a smoky head, and an amethyst head. They did not happen at the same time. But they ended up in the right part of the pocket where when all, all of a sudden everything started fusing and they all grew together and it turned into a, just a really fun and neat piece. Slotty quartz. Very bad slotty quartz. The first time we found stuff like this, we were all shaking our heads. I think it's mica that grew in and then weathered out. I could be wrong. Uh, recently, we found a piece this year that had uh, an inclusion that was very interesting. And after further study, it turned out to be mica, probably muscovite. So it would make sense that mica could slot in here. But there are other things that could have done it. A feldspar crystal, potentially, um, you know, and hydrite, possibly. We're pretty mono-mineralic up here. You know, we've got some pyrite and some limonite after pyrite and the sericite mica. But, you know, who knows what might have grown there 50, 60, 70 million years ago. But these little slots are fun. Tabulars. At Hallelujah, the tabulars form because quartz gets crushed and splintered and then it gets recrystallized and healed. And in this case, you have both a tabular and a bent. So in the area where it's bent here, it was obviously getting a lot of stress while recrystallization was happening, and it wasn't enough to completely break it, but you have micro-break recrystallization, micro-break recrystallization, and at the end of that, you have a bent crystal. And you can see on the front piece of it here, the line that shows where all the micro fractures are. Some pockets are filled with this stuff and they're really, really fun. Yeah, take that in for a second. So yes, it got pressure, it sharded, it didn't completely come apart and then it recrystallized so there are crystal faces even on the inside of this thing. It's crazy. And these are some of the funnest oddities. They're also really fragile. Uh, so you've got to be careful that you don't break them. But this is just one of those magic of hallelujah rocks. Now here, you've got tabular. You've got scepter, you've got two crystals growing together, and then they kind of just fused. So this spot here, you know, they just ended up in the right part of the pocket. Uh, in Joe's display, he has a piece called the interceptor, and it's two scepter heads that fuse together. It's amazing. It's one of these great, great oddities that we just love out there. And the other neat thing with all the recrystallization, there's no points of attachment left anywhere here. That's a total floater piece now. So this thing's just weird. This started out as one crystal and is kind of turned into two. We don't know if it's some kind of weird twin law, if it's just restricted growth somehow, but we get things like this fairly often at, at Hallelujah. We also get where a single crystal will start 
have a partial termination that was obviously covered with mica at some point, and then the rest of it just grows into a point. They're just really funky things. I'm pretty sure I've got a couple of those in, in the stock we brought. Two of my favorites. Um, I actually put the, the first one is, is in the article. Honestly, that thing just speaks volumes to me. That piece should not have stayed together. It was ripped apart by what had to be some pretty impressive tectonics. And then it just fused back together. You know, kind of reminds any of us that have had a major accident and maybe we're not walking or running as good as we used to, but you know what? We're still together. And I love that. And I love that, you know, what happens with the recrystallization. And then the one on the right, the sword and the stone, that thing, you've got a scepter that ended up in a pocket where one of these celestials was growing. And for some reason, the growth preferred to continue on the celestial and not on the scepter. And it grew around it. And that way it freezes the piece in. There was another one that was found a number of years ago by a gentleman named Andre that we nicknamed the Pentaceptor. And it was one single bulb with a little stem that had four other bulbs stuck into it. And it was obvious that the, the, bulb, the main bulb had grown around these other scepter heads. These are just the things that happen in a pocket when you get a lot more hot fluid coming in or gas. And this was my favorite from the last dig. I nicknamed it Gemini because I am a Gemini and I did find it in June. And it's two doubly terminated. It's, they're not, you can call them barbells. They're, they're very slight, but it's just a neat, neat, neat thing. And it's basically, you know, the two things had to have fused together during a later period of recrystallization. So both of these things grew, got a scepter, broke, fell into a pocket, regrew another scepter on the other side, and then fused together. These pockets were busy. The one nice thing about a place that so many people have gotten to dig is that every pocket has a potential. You know, where I found this, I nicknamed this pocket Perseverance because somebody had already dug in there for a while and decided that, yeah, they were done. But in this case, I looked at it and we also, our operator was taking a break, so we weren't going to get a scrape anytime soon, so you might as well dig somewhere, right? So I kept working. I found a bulb and this little crystal kept getting in the way. And then I realized that it was actually kind of stuck in there, which meant it might be a scepter. And so I did it right, cleared everything, and out came the best scepter I ever found. And that is an experience that many people here can echo, because almost, you know, probably at least half the people here have dug there. So it's just, it's an incredibly prolific locality that, creates so many odd and unusual things. And then we have the, this is actually a sunrise picture because I can't just do a sunset for the end of everything. <laughs> so there we have it. You have any questions? Yes. Part of what was crossing my mind when you were talking about the various uh, rotation events was kind of the time period, right? When you see other stems that have been uh, uh, rendered smoky by the low levels of radiation, you know, often the uh, the heads or the stalks, you know, they're not smoky, they just coagulate, but you know, they're much less irradiated. And I was sort of wondering what. Uh, know what the time frame between those events and how long it was, you know, I mean, because it looks like it was widely separated, but you think that the scepter heads would be also smoky if they were in there that long. 
top, and another top top. What was the one that had the advance and I had the capture with the rope around it like the, uh, uh, that could have been differing uh, facilitation of that scoop, but I was thinking. Right, so the question is that, um, first of all, what's the time period between the different crystallization events? And my understanding, and it's actually written better in the article, so I could, you can refer to that, but I believe most of the mineralization happened between about 95 million years ago and maybe 60 to 70. So there's been a lot of time where it sat, but evidently it seems like it got a lot more radiation in the first 10 million years or so. So that's the first part of the question. The second one was about the sword and the stone piece. And it was about um, how does something like that form. And I believe that the, the original scepter was definitely formed in earlier, two earlier periods of crystallization. And then during the time when the bulbs were forming, for some reason, no recrystallization happened on the scepter, but the bulb that was there grew up and around it. That work? Yeah. Excellent. Did I hear anything else? We have tons of show and tell next door. Um, Julian, anything to add? <laughs> yes. The, the question is, do we see any fluid inclusions? And the answer is yes. Um, we don't see a bunch of them, but in the, the last stage, generally, is where you see the most of them. And because the growth was, I, I almost sensed that the growth was really rapid because of all the, the different textures you see in a lot of those celestial-like pieces, and a lot of them trap fluids. But too many of them, you've got a lot of negative faces going on, and so a lot of them are open to the air. I've had a couple of absolutely phenomenal anhydros that disappeared when the rock dried. But there are still a number of them that will, that will have um, you know, both fluid inclusions and fluid inclusions with a moving bubble. Yes? These all seem very, very large. Do you have any micros that are scepters, et cetera, and in these growth patterns which you're talking about? So the, the, the question was, we have a lot of very large things that we've been showing off here. What exists in the micro and small world? Um, there are small things. There, I, won't, I don't think I could call them micro uh, by definition. The, the smallest crystals are usually reserved for... Um, the, the clusters, there's, there's a lot of clusters that have really, really tiny crystals. I have not seen like under one centimeter scepters or anything like that. They, they, these things had enough time to grow in enough space. That's the other thing. There's a lot of space. This is, we're looking at it as something not too dissimilar from the breccia pipes that you see in the Northwest. And in between these areas of uneroded granite, there is a lot of space. And so that tends to lend itself to larger crystals. Toby. Uh, you dug at both claims. Um, what are the common differences that you see between the two claims? Crystal okay, so the question was, as I've dug at both claims, what are the differences between the, the two sides as far as crystal growth? The, the main thing is our granite tends to be harder. What that means is there is more of the first couple of generations of crystal growth and less of the last. So the fluids didn't make its way to nearly as many pockets on our side as it did next door. At next door, you don't see, we, we have these wonderful triangular structures. They don't have that so much. They do in a few areas, like under Gnarly Knob, but um, 
for the most part, their pockets have had a lot more tectonic activity than ours have, which lends itself to much more late stage material, uh, late stage growth, which lends itself to a lot more amethyst. Their side has more amethyst than ours does. Their side gets more of these crazy, weird cathedral jacare pieces there, where they're, the crystal was searching for every little nook and cranny in the vug that it could go. We get a lot more of those simple scepters than they do. Yes, Don. What is the matrix? Uh, in other words, uh, I've never been there. Is it dirt or mud or is it solid rock? Okay, the, the question is what's the matrix material? So for most of the material at Hallelujah Junction, it is a granitic, whether it's fresh granite or DG. It's all granite based. And then in the pockets, there's definitely a certain amount of clay that, that's formed. And there's also a very large amount of mica. Uh, that's actually, that's been tested out as sericite mica. But any of the things, the, the matrix is, is granitic. And often on the, the borders of the pockets, are very, very distinct where the quartz starts to grow and they actually uh, tend to be relatively easy to extract that way as well. Rick, we got a question online from Ooh. Joshua Hyman saying, oh. do you ever find a scepter in two parts, the head and stem separated but close to each other in the pocket? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yes, Joshua, um, the question is, do we find them separated? And, and often we find them separated more than we find them together as a result of having had so much tectonic activity. And the art of making fits is huge to our production at Hallelujah. Um, of our group, Joe George was the first one to really do a spectacular job at, at looking for fits, and he's taught us all, and everybody on crew is now really good at it. And for instance, the one of the best pieces we found this year, uh, I found the fit while I was cleaning, because we didn't have a chance to really look for them as much as on the mine as we normally do, um, due to an Airbnb situation, which we will not talk about. Um, <laughs> But there is nothing quite as fun as working on something and knowing a piece is one step away from either goodness or greatness, and then finding that that piece that fits on was the second best scepter. Oh, man. Uh, anybody wants to see later, I'll show you pictures of the bunny ear that we ended up with. And what, one thing you do have to be careful about at Hallelujah, because there's been so much recrystallization a lot of times, you know it's the fit, but it doesn't fit anymore because it's been recrystallized. So sometimes you just can't make that fit. Uh, but if it's a, a fresher break, something that happened during tectonic activity in the last you know, 10 to 20 million years, they normally fit right on. Yes, all the way in the back. Have there ever been any sceptered twins found? Excellent question. To my knowledge, one. And uh, that is in the collection of Anne Frazier. Uh, and it was, I, I, I'm almost embarrassed. Most all of us missed it. Because we were looking at the, a big bulb scepter head. And we didn't notice that little thing coming off the edge. Uh, and Joe actually spotted it at one of the shows. And he's like, y'all know there's a twin there. And we're like, oh, well, look at that. So, um, but that's the only one I know of that had a scepter attached to it. Only one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. You can turn that off. <laughs>